listening to NPR talk about how living in this valley over the course of a lifetime and the cumulative impact of pollution here can take two years off a person's life. So I got to work. I started as an activist. I was holding up signs, organizing protests. And eventually I realized that in order to get the results I wanted, I needed to be in the room, not shut outside of it. And that's been my approach ever since. Salt Lake City has grown a lot since Mr. Anderson was the mayor, but we've also grown up. And that's the biggest difference between me and my opponents in this election. With the exception of maybe a week or two earlier this month when they endorsed each other as each other's second choices, they've spent the majority of this campaign fighting on Twitter and Instagram, calling each other names, insulting each other, and pretty much everyone else. Salt Lake City has lived through tough times when our mayor fought with everyone. And in some ways, we're still paying the price for that. Being mayor of this capital city, of this blue dot in this very red state, sometimes means swallowing your pride to get what you need done. It means not picking fights that you haven't thought very carefully about. And Salt Lake City is finally rebuilding those bridges of the past we have alliances and partnerships where we used to have enemies and bridges that have been burned. I'm proud of the progress that we've made in Salt Lake City. Ultimately, this election is coming down to tone. How do you want your city to be led, by a builder or by a destroyer? And that's the difference between my, me and my opponents here today. All right, former Mayor Rocky Anderson. Thank you. I was elected twice and ended my eight years in office with a 59% approval by those I served. Mitt Romney and I worked closely together in welcoming the world to the greatest Winter Olympic Games ever. John Huntsman Sr. and I created the Alliance for Unity, where we brought in diverse leaders from throughout the community to build bridges. And that's exactly what we did. I think what you just heard from the current mayor, her history is completely off because I have been known to be anti-partisan. I don't believe partisanship has any role in making great things happen. When I was mayor, we created world-class environmental programs. Uh, we reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 31% in city operations in just three years. I don't just talk about it like our current mayor. We can show quantifiable changes. And because of that, we won the World Leadership Award in London for our environmental programs. And also, I won the EPA Climate Protection Award. We created amazing youth after school and summer programs called Youth City. It's still in place. It's enhanced the lives of tens of thousands of people. And likewise, we are going to fulfill the, the crushing need that so many families have by providing citywide 24 hours, seven days. proudly push the city forward after it's gone backwards for so long under the present administration. That's time. Um, now we move to the question portion debate. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer and you'll have 60 seconds for any follow-up questions. Um, Aaron, you go first here. Uh, Salt Lake City is considered a key partner in the uh, Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program known as CREP. Um, how is Salt Lake City faring on its goal of providing 100% renewable energy ahead of the 2030 goal established under the program? Yeah, the Commission on, Re on Renewable Energy that is a partnership between 18 municipalities is the path in the state of Utah to 100% net renewable energy. No one is going to have to check a box the way we do with Blue Sky today on our power bill or through the gas company. Every outlet in this city is going to 100% net renewable energy, and we're going to do it by 2030. 
Right now, the next step is going to the Public Service Commission with Rocky Mountain Power. Now, across the nation, other cities have the opportunity, in many cases, to go out to bid for their own power, to say, here's how much energy we need, solar, uh, thermal, wind power, Providers, tell us if you can bring it. We don't have that right in Salt Lake City or anywhere in the state of Utah. We have to work with Rocky Mountain Power. And when I became the mayor, they said, I know the plan was 2030, but we've had some other pressures in our portfolio from legislative decisions in the state of Oregon and elsewhere. We can't do it until 2050, 2050. And instead of trying to get a headline, throwing a fit and throwing bombs and pointing fingers at Rocky Mountain Power, we stayed at the table and we negotiated them back to 2030. We are all going there. We're getting there by 2030. And as I mentioned, the next step is the Public Service Commission. The goal is that there's only a few cents of difference in what we're paying today to going to 100% renewable energy. So there are not impacts on um, the households across the city. So we're finally on track. Rocky, you've talked a little bit about you want that goal to be even uh, closer to now than 2030. How would you go about um, pushing Rocky Mountain Power to make that happen. Well, it's interesting. Four years ago, our current mayor was campaigning saying she was going to move the date up to 2023. And here we are, not one thing has been done to provide 100% renewable energy for Salt Lake City. This is the single most important thing we can do to provide an example for the rest of the world is how we can all fight against the global climate crisis. We can work with Rocky Mountain Power uh, and use our, the franchise agreement between the city and Rocky Mountain to push that date up, uh, like the mayor said she was gonna do in negotiations, but never did. And we can also, of course, look into forming our own power <coughs> utility that's 100% powered by renewable sources. Murray has its own power utility. How many people knew that? And I was thrilled to be present the day that we hooked up a methane recovery uh, system to the landfill and it went right into Murray's power system to power hundreds of homes in a renewable fashion. That was that many years ago. We made that kind of progress. So there are a lot of things we can do. We could build collaborations. Uh, we're down now to uh, 17 or 18 communities. It started off more than that. That's We've time. been losing them. We all need to come together to pursue that objective. And Aaron, I know you want to rebut what he just said. Um, I will give you time to do that. And then Michael, we'll go to you. I apologize. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you. We are on track. We could have been till 2050 to have this energy. And on top of it, we built an 80 megawatt solar farm that's under construction right now west of Magna that's going to supply almost 100% of the city's municipal power. And that will be coming online in 2025. So libraries, the park system, city hall, police precincts, all 100% renewable energy by 2025, almost there. This is real work in the state of Utah, which is a super majority Republican legislature that really supports monopolies like Rocky Mountain Power. We have to work in the real context of this state. I never promised 2023 because that was never a reality. I want you to be, I want to be I'm always going to be super honest with you. You're going to hear a lot of absolutes, complete failures, totally not done, absolutely everything. Hyperbole is not, it's rarely true. And you're gonna hear a lot of it from my opponent for this entire debate. I'm always gonna tell you the truth about what's really going on. All right, Michael, I apologize, go ahead. Sure, so I'm the youngest one up here. Um, I'm 35, I'm a millennial. If elected, I'd be the third youngest mayor in city history. I think it's very apparent to uh, my generation and Gen Z, uh, us younger folks, of how serious climate change is, how much we have to act right now. Um, you know, renewable energy is the future and we don't have a choice. We have to work right now to invest in that and, and, and make sure we're achieving, you know, complete renewable energy. It goes to be, uh, as well to the Great Salt Lake of protecting the lake, um, which I've been very um, focused on of, you know, making the lake, uh, giving it personhood status, um, having the EPA step in and declare an environmental uh, emergency and actually, you know, going above the state because they, they've been very clear that they haven't acted. Um, it's one thing to say you're environmentalist, it's another thing to actually show it. You know, Aaron talks about being a 
a clean air activist, uh, whatever that means. But um, in terms of historic preservation, it's the greenest form of construction. And we know her track record for destroying historic buildings, um, giving public property away to developers and corporations. Um, we haven't seen uh, historic reconstruction being utilized, which is, again, the greenest form of construction that brings more jobs and more money to that. Um, she's also talked about, you know, not uh, fighting against I-15. How much uh, pollution will I-15 expansion add to, to Salt Lake, to Utah? Uh, is something we absolutely cannot do, um, being one of the most polluted valleys in, in the, the country. We, we, we'll get to that topic in just a moment. Um, Rocky, I know you want to respond, but let's respond within this context. Um, the CEO of Rocky Mountain Power stood up next to Governor Spencer Cox and said, that the company would not be ready for 100% green energy until 2050, except for Salt Lake City. He said it's just cost prohibitive. So how would you get him to an earlier target when he can't make other cities until 2050? Well, I just wanna see that we do absolutely everything. When the mayor just a minute ago said it wasn't possible to do it by 2023, and she used the word hyperbole, I can show you her campaign folder that where she said she will aggressively negotiate in order to reach the 2023 date. And she also was quoted in a newspaper article right after she was elected talking about that 2023 date. Now, I think we've got to do everything we can, but you don't wait until these, these timelines out in the future. I've asked. Where can you show us the quantification, one ounce less of greenhouse gas emissions during the last four years under the Mendenhall administration? It hasn't happened. We quantified it, and as I said, we demonstrated not only a 31% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in city operations, but we went around the world to teach other municipal officials how they could accomplish the same thing. This is a global Thank issue and we've all got to get together. But can we move on to the Great Salt Lake? I want to talk about water usage. Um, according to the Utah Rivers Council, Salt Lake City residents use 240 gallons of water per person per day. Now, in comparison, Tucson, Arizona uses 120, Denver 142. We know we have to protect the Great Salt Lake. What do you propose the city should do to encourage water conservation among its residents? And I know a large percentage goes to agriculture, the majority goes to agriculture. But what will you do to encourage conservation within residents, within its residents? We'll start with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, when I became mayor, we had an ordinance that required 100% turf in people's front yards and the, and the parking strip. I thought that was outrageous. I wanted to make a point of it. I engaged in civil disobedience as mayor and I ripped out every shred of grass in my front yard and put in drought tolerant landscaping. The New York Times got a hold of it. They did a front page story on the, the nation section of their newspaper showing the mayor of Salt Lake standing out in front of his yard, which they said is not only distinctive, but is illegal. That forced the council's hand and they finally saw the wisdom. Yeah, we've got to adjust this. Uh, we all should get away from turf in every way possible. But the city, under Mayor Mendenhall's administration, she's right there at the city and county building. It would be great if they would run their sprinklers at full blast during rainstorms. And I have photographs of it. I was appalled to see that their hypocrisy and telling us, oh, you've all got to do what you can do, but the city itself isn't going to do it. And we've got all this turf, we've got all these, these golf courses, no transparency in terms of the water use that's there. We've got to walk the walk. I do it in my personal life, and I did it when I was mayor. We're not seeing that kind of aggressive leadership, uh, either for our city or for the international community, as I did when I was mayor. Thank you, Rocky. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I know your the question was about individuals. I just want to say though that you know uh, climate change. A lot of the time, individuals get scapegoated when it's a hundred companies responsible for the vast majority of climate change across the world. And we see this again with the Great Salt Lake, U.S. Magnesium Agriculture taking you know 70, 80 percent of the water out of there. 
So it's important we focus on the big picture, but just to answer the question, there's so much we can be can be done. I think a lot of the first step is just educating the public that we live in a desert here. You know, having lawns and things like that just doesn't make sense. Making sure we are, you know, incentivizing people to zero scape their, their lawns, um, setting up programs for native uh, landscaping, which actually, you know, in my opinion, looks better than having a lawn. And then um, also with businesses as well, it's important to not just, you know, blame this on individual, individual people, local businesses, you know, 7-Eleven running, you know, their, their water in the middle of the day, incentivizing them to move away from grass as well. Um, and then inf enforcing that um, all new construction um, has more efficient water usage. So, you know, people that are showering or using the bathroom, that the water is being recycled more and it's not as, as wasteful as some of the older technology was. Um, it's very important that we do this, but again, I, I wanna reiterate the, the importance of not focusing on the smallest piece of the puzzle here, focusing on US Magnesium, the businesses that are taking 70, 80% of the water, focusing on the 100 companies around the world that are responsible for climate change um, and not scapegoating individuals. Michael, thank you. And Aaron, I have a more targeted question, same topic for you. So your 2023 fiscal budget proposed an 18% increase in the monthly residential water bill. Um, you're doing a, an audit, you added a drought surcharge. What, what else can we do to monitor this residential use? Salt Lakers love our namesake. And I think by and large, we're incredibly environmentally conscious people here in Salt Lake City. And so over the last two years, I put a drought uh, alert in place for all residents asking residents, asking residents to conserve water because we're just simply asking. The city put more strict restrictions on ourselves, despite what he says about sprinklers. Yellow is the new green, and Salt Lake City has been putting those restrictions in place. But in 2022, you as Salt Lakers can serve 2.9 billion gallons of water. We use 2.9 billion gallons less. And I want you to know that in the last 20 years, as our city has grown about 20% in 20 years, our water consumption is down 31% because of the kind of efficiencies we're building in, the business case for efficiency, and people electing to do what's right when it comes to water conservation. We're doing a top to bottom audit throughout Salt Lake City Corporation, parks, buildings, everything, to figure out what do we need, what kind of conservation measures or technology can help us conserve even more water. And the 13 billion gallons of water that come out of our water treatment facility, every drain, every toilet and sink runs there. It is under threat of development diverting that water for industrial use, and we need to guarantee it goes to the lake. And so we are submitting the, that paperwork with the state of Utah to legally and permanently, according to the city, dedicate that water to the Great Salt Lake. We're gonna keep doing more as more ideas come up. We don't have the corner market on great ideas in Thank City you, Hall, and we keep working with the conservation community to find new things to do. Thank you. Uh, state legislatures across the country moving to restrict or override policy making decisions that are made by cities. Alabama, the legislature moved to restrict Birmingham from setting a minimum wage. Texas, they're restricting sanctuary cities. Uh, in Ohio, blocking Cleveland's ability to set city construction contract requirements. What will you do to create relationships with the state legislature so that your administration doesn't get caught up in that crossfire and these, the legislature walks back some of your policy making decisions? Michael, I'll start with you. Yeah, this is a great question and one I talk a lot about and I think one that differentiates me from the opponents here. Um, obviously, you try to you know, work with everybody. I'm, I'd, I'd go to the, the governor of the legislature and try to get them to be on board with our platform because it's what's best for the community, what's best for the public. But you know, if, if things break down, then, then there's always the situation where the city has to you know, protect itself, has to protect the community, sometimes from the state. Um, there's a lot of talks about inclusionary zoning, rent control, and how the state won't let us do that. I think that's really nonsense because um, it's what the people need. And, and the state is, you know, Overwhelmingly, there's a huge chunk of people that have ties to real estate, just like the city does. And um, you know, these laws are written for by real estate people for real estate people against what's best for the community. They're they're there to raise prices, um, and, and they need to be fought against. And um, as Salt Lake continues to grow, we talk about growth a lot. We're gonna you know come into our own independence, like any major city like Boston or you know Seattle or Portland, New York, where we're gonna have to take back independent control that the state has overstepped our bounds on. You know, the, the city has municipal control over 
over what's best for the public. It, and, it, and the state has gone too far in a lot of ways across a lot of issues. And it's not, you know, anything personal, but like the city has to push back against that. We have to retake control and do what's best for the community at all times. All right, uh, Aaron, would you answer that question? Sure, when I came into public office as city council person 10 years ago, I joined the legislative subcommittee for the city because I'd been working on air quality at the legislature and I wanted to keep that going. And one of the first things key legislators and, and some of the leadership of the state told me was that we're still punishing you for Rocky, even though he hadn't been in office for years. It's in the Tribune of having legislators, city legislators, ask him not to come up to the legislature because it was making it harder for them to pass their bills on behalf of Salt Lake City. Even his own city council at the time begged him to disengage and said that he's given this legislature every reason to snub Salt Lake City again. When I came in as mayor, the pandemic started a couple months later. And definitely I saw the situation and what we needed to do differently at times than the state leadership did. Instead of getting the headline and trying to get on the front page of the, of the New York Times and then force somebody's hand, I'd call the state legislature leadership up, the governor, the president, and speaker, if I was going to do something that I knew they weren't going to like. I'd call them out of respect for our relationship as government and say, here's what I'm looking at, here's the facts, here's my options, and this is what I'm going to do. And I'd ask for their feedback. Most of the time we ended up ending the call agreeing to disagree, but they were appreciative that I'd reach out. And the legislative backlash on city has simply not been there the way that it was when Mr. Anderson was in leadership because we show up as partners even if we disagree. Rocky? The current mayor calls herself a clean air advocate. Advocate. Not anybody that's actually accomplished anything. Well, you all won't remember, some of us in the room will. When I was mayor, the state was going to move forward with an illegal, under federal law, legacy highway. It was environmentally disastrous. It would have damaged the wetlands. It would have generated more pollution, more sprawl, more development, and then it just goes on and on. I stood proudly with the Sierra Club, and we sued to stop that initial legacy highway, and uh, although we ended up not having standing, they won in the court, and they, the state had to go back to the drawing board and come up with now what's now the legacy parkway. Now, you can't have it both ways. You can't call yourself a clean air advocate and then keep throwing this out and saying, oh, the legislature was so upset because you took a leadership position, a stand for this entire community, a stand for the environment, and a stand for the public health. And that's exactly what I did. I will always be proud of it. And the people of the city were very proud that we took on that battle. So again, you can't just seek a, a place at the table like this mayor keeps talking about, where you're with the rich and the powerful, sometimes in order to vindicate legal rights and protect the public health and environment, you need to stand up. I'm, Go ahead, I'm so glad that he brought this up because we have done so much and I'm glad to have the chance to tell you about what's happened on air quality in Salt Lake City. Besides 100% renewable energy, Salt Lake City has been transforming from backyards to the highways, fighting the I-15 expansion, protecting now that no neighborhood homes are going to be destroyed when and if I-15 is expanded. We got the city council to pass an e-bike rebate for all Salt Lakers, income dependent. You can get a rebate to buy an e-bike in Salt Lake City. We've added bus routes that are 15 minutes or less punching through the west-east divide in Salt Lake City. We put 25,000 free bus passes into the hands of every public school student in Salt Lake City for the first time their parent, and all of their teachers. We've improved over 200 bus stops in Salt Lake City. We're just getting started. The e-bike system, the bike routes, the nine line that's punching through, the green loop that we're going to build, the pedestrianization of Main Street downtown. Oh yeah, we're doing things. We can't just get headlines. You have to actually get things done. And our air quality is improving because of it, just like our water reduction is coming down despite our growth. Salt Lake City is going in the right direction. All right, um, we're going to move on to um, the jazz. Uh, we heard Ryan Smith talk about bringing another professional team to Utah, possibly an NHL team. He's gone on record saying that perhaps the current home of the jazz isn't the best, not bad, 
but not the best place for a hockey team. And according to the Salt Lake Tribune, Draper's mayor said he's interested in bringing a, quote, major league sports entertainment center to the former site of Utah State Prison. What would you do to ensure the Jazz stay downtown, Mayor? Yeah, we are working closely with Ryan Smith and Smith Entertainment Group, and we agree, if you look across this nation, no longer will there be Major League Sports arenas built with a parking lot surrounding them, and that's it. Sports now is not just about showing up in your car, walking into the game, walking back out to your car and going home. It's about an experience. We want bars and restaurants. We want great hotels right there. We want a place where even families who don't have a ticket to get in can watch the game outside on a big screen and let their kids run around and play. That's an entertainment district, and that's what we're working with them, with the county, and with other stakeholders like the Downtown Alliance and the Chamber to figure out in a built-out downtown, how do we make this happen? We can make this happen. It's going to take some legislative changes as well that allow you to buy a margarita at the Cafe Rio right outside and walk into the game with it. The way you fund these entertainment districts is a real conversation that we really can't have the kind of division that he creates coming in and messing it up. Because as we know from Point of the Mountain development, there's lots of places that an entertainment district could go, but there's only one place in the state of Utah that it should go, and it's this capital city with a 12 minute ride on tracks to our international airport that's the best one in the nation, this best recovering downtown in the nation, 139% more people coming downtown than we had in 2019. Yeah, Draper doesn't have anything on Salt Lake City except a big empty field. Uh, Rocky. Yeah, well, it was during my administration that Larry Miller bought the Salt Lake Bees, helping to continue the 150 year tradition of professional baseball in Salt Lake City. It was during this current mayor's administration that we lost the bees. And I've never heard yet, I don't think any of you have, I don't think anybody in the public has heard her explain what it was that Gail Miller said drove the decision to take the bees out of Salt Lake City. I think it was a real betrayal of this community. I know Larry Miller, if he weren't around, would never have stood for it. We, you go into the ballpark area, what do you find? You find open drug use, you find encampments. We have got to address these issues. When New York City actors come in to, to perform in a play at Pioneer Theater, and they call because they're in hotels downtown, and they call and say, we need a place up by the university. This place is so scary. We're fr from New York City. And by the way, did you know, even though this mayor says that encampments, you can't guarantee that there aren't gonna be encampments all over the city, there aren't encampments in New York City because they don't allow them. We have got to provide a safe community and we've got to deal effectively with the homelessness crisis and the affordability crisis we have. How many of you can find a truly permanently affordable place to live in Salt Lake City. That's not what this administration's been working on. They've been working Rocky, on. Thank you. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I just want to mention here, just to, to add some context, according to the Salt Lake City Police Department, crime in the ballpark neighborhood is down. Okay. Can now, I... it, has, it, it has increased in other neighborhoods um, like uh, Liberty Wells, East Liberty Park, Central City, but the ballpark, according to the Salt Lake City Police, is down. Michael, um, go ahead and answer that question. Yeah, so, um, you know, losing the jazz would be a disaster. Um, one thing that sets me apart is I am a business owner, so like similar to Lord Ryan Smith, so I understand, you know, the concerns he has with moving the team. No matter what those conversations would be, though, they'd be open, honest, and transparent, which is not what we've seen with this current administration who took donations from Gail Miller while they were negotiating the ballpark deal, announced the deal, just blindsided the whole community. Everyone was pissed off about it. Um, baseball leaving. Literally, the ballpark is the name of the neighborhood. Baseball has been there for 100 years. The community was not involved in this, similar to the Pantages deal. All these backroom deals behind the community going against the public. You know, so <laughs> at the first of this debate, she talks about being a builder, but she's not that. She's a destroyer. She, she moved the ballpark out. She destroyed the Pantages. The whole story about that 
I wasn't just trying to save the theater. I was trying to buy it. I made a $2 million offer to buy it. I rallied national experts to restore it. We had plans to build affordable housing above the theater, to bring Salt Lake Film Society over, to build a whole cinema paradise, to create a historic theater district downtown that would bring billions to downtown Salt Lake over the next co in the coming decades that would combine with the Capitol and Eccles Theater and bolster all the theaters. That's what an entertainment district is. She destroyed that. She destroyed that for a backroom zero dollar deal to build studio housing for a thousand dollars a piece. But that's not building. That is going against the public. That, that is going against everything Salt Lake City stands for and pushing that, us that, back and that not is time. And forward. And Lawrence, can I note that? that yes, you can. I just want to note that if we could stay on topic for these questions. Yeah, go ahead, respond to that. Thank you. What Larry Miller would be thrilled about is bringing Major League Baseball to Salt Lake City, and that's what they're doing. There's no secret about why the bees are leaving. The, uh, the Miller Group acquired 1,500 acres out around Daybreak in South Jordan, and they decided to anchor that new community they're gonna build with a AAA baseball team. That's never been a secret. It was their prerogative to leave at the end of the contract. We fought for over a year trying to convince them they should stay. In the end, after they decided to leave, they told us, we actually want to bring Major League Baseball to Salt Lake City, and I promise you Larry Miller would be thrilled wherever in heaven he's at that baseball is going to stay in Salt Lake City. What's really going to happen in Ballpark is a $100 million investment in the people of Ballpark. That ballpark is activated 71 days a year for baseball, and it's shuttered the rest of the year. We need 365 days of activation, and that's what we're going to have on 13 and a half acres between the parking lot and the ballpark itself with a $100 million trust to support the ballpark neighborhood. Baseball hey, could Mayor, never have done that's that. That's time. Thank you. Um, okay, let's go back to crime. Uh, looking at the current Salt Lake City Police Department's CompStat report, it runs through the week of October 9th through the 15th. I pulled it. Um, citywide, violent crime is down 10.9% year to date. Property crimes down 15.1% year to date. However, drug violations are up 39.2%. Weapons violations are up 8.4%. So factoring in these numbers, the latest um, from the Salt Lake Police Department, do you feel the city is doing enough to manage police and ensure public safety? Michael, you can start with that. Absolutely not. So right now we're wasting millions and millions of dollars sending the police out to do abatements that I showed you that are immoral, that are unjust, that are crimes against humanity, attacking our most vulnerable people. I've talked to the cops about it. I talked to a detective this morning about it. They hate doing abatements. They don't like doing abatements. They're pissed off at the city for having to do the abatements when they should be focusing on real crime, violent crime, and actually doing their job and not ha hassling and, and abusing homeless people that you know have nothing. So it's a huge waste of money to be doing this. It's not just a, a, a attacking the homeless people, it's attacking our city, it's attacking our community groups that donate thousands and thousands of dollars, sleeping beds, blankets, uh, tents, over and over again that just get thrown away like those pictures I showed you. That's not what the police should be doing. And you know, I'm also in my platform that I released, I, I'm very uh, adamant about decriminalizing drugs, taking drugs from being a criminal uh, situation to a healthcare and, um, um, a health issue. You know, this has been shown to save money. The war on drugs has been an absolute failure for decades. Police should not be arresting people for, for doing drugs. They should be, again, focusing on violent crimes, crimes that are they're actually there to solve. And we need to, um, you know, have the police be doing the stuff that they're supposed to be doing, not wasting time, wasting money, attacking the homeless, chasing drugs around. And, and actually, you know, decriminalizing drugs would, would cut the kneecaps off of uh, um, drug dealers and organized crime from, you know, spreading throughout the city. Michael, thank you. Rocky, go ahead. How do you manipulate crime statistics? You look the other way when it's committed. You don't make arrests, you don't write them up, and then you say, oh, look, crime is down. There's a business next to the Gell Miller Resource Center in the ballpark district, over $60,000 worth of broken windows and not one arrest. Uh, Randy uh, Topham down at Cake Salon, 1010 South State Street, he's called the police dozens of times. He said they show up maybe half the time. He said every time they just tell people to move along. And he asked them, he said, what are you going to do to provide safety here? They're, they're lighting five, seven fires in one month around his building. They're harassing his customers. They're out there having dangerous drug parties. And the police say, 
the mayor has just told us to tell them to move along. Now that's one account, but then I talked to Scott down at Antique Treasures Antiques on 6th South and 5th West. He told me exactly the same. I didn't suggest it to him. He said, yeah, the police, you, my son quit because of assaults, because we're having to go out and clean up feces and urine every day. The city won't respond, they won't do anything about it. And when the police do show up, they tell us, the mayor said to just tell them to move along. Same thing at the Mid-City Salon on 3rd South, just below Main Street. They just closed two weeks ago for exactly the Rocky, same thank reason. You. Um, I just want to give you 10 seconds to respond to this question. Are you suggesting that the Salt Lake Police manipulate their crime statistics? The, yes, there's, they're manipulated by not enforcing the law and doing what the mayor has told them, and okay, that is to thank look you. the other way. I just wanted way. to clarify that. Ed, and, go ahead. And I want to just start by clarifying that you might have some whiplash from what he's been saying, that the police are either brutalizing and completely inhumane, or they're looking the other way and they're doing nothing. A city's most important job, hands down, is to keep its people safe. If you can't do that, if you can't keep your residents and your visitors safe, everything else is undermined. And this nation saw an increase in violent crime and property crimes throughout the pandemic into early 2021. Salt Lake City, state of Utah, actually, as a whole, was not immune from this. But unlike a lot of other Democrat-led cities in the West and in, the, in parts of this country, we have completely turned that around. Our data is real. Our call volume's been increasing since 2020. We're responding to calls faster and faster. And in the last year, our crime is at the lowest point it's been in years. And on the west side of Salt Lake City, she, she gave you the citywide crime stats, Crime in District 2 in Rose Park and Glendale is at a 29% low. District 2 is at the lowest it's been in over 10 years. Salt Lake City did the biggest set of police reforms we've ever done back in August of 2020. Those body camera, use of force, and we put in place a commission on racial equity and policing that permanently evaluates our culture of policing, our budget, and our training of our police officers. And they recommend changes that we end up implementing through the administration and the city council has ended up funding. We have civilians on the police department now that we never had before. We doubled our social workers to come out. This Aaron, is the kind of change and we are never done with the evaluation and the reevaluation of what thank policing you. looks like in the um, city. I, Just a quick I'll let rebuttal. Rocky respond and then um, you may sure. respond. Thanks very much. The Comstat report put out by the police department at the end of last year, all of 2022, shows, this is so laughable, a 58.9% reduction in drug crimes in the Rio Grande area. Now, if any of you know the Rio Grande area, you wanna score any time, day or night, meth, heroin, you wanna go down and see people shooting up, smoking it, that's where it's happening. You know that is exhibit A to the case that our police are told, just look the other way. Our own mayor has said, you can't arrest your way out of it. I agree with that if the result is going to just be put them in jail and prison, like the, the old paradigm in our criminal justice system. We put in place the nation's most comprehensive restorative justice programs when I was mayor for eight years. And what we would do is solve problems rather than punish and get people into drug treatment, into mental health treatment, rather than focus on punishment and retribution. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, so it is the mayor's job to take care of the people, but the problem here is she doesn't consider all people in the city, you know, community members. The homeless people are community members. They live here, they belong here. They're voters just like everyone else. They're residents here. They deserve to have respect and, and a mayor that works for them as well, not a mayor that goes and throws their only belongings in the world away over and over repeatedly every single day. Every single day. This is literally um, from a few weeks ago. During this campaign, she's fenced off areas down in the Rio Grande where the homeless stay, where they've been camping. She's, she's escalated the uh, homeless abatements and made things worse while she's running. What's she gonna do with for another four years? You know, so how, how is a, a mayor supposed to run a city if they don't listen to the people, they don't meet with their homeless people, they don't uh, treat the, the community with respect, they don't even listen to their own police department that hates doing these abatements, that doesn't want to do them anymore, and they don't protect the most vulnerable people in this whole damn community. 
Michael, thank you. I, I, I know a lot has been talked about in the past at these debates about homelessness, particularly last night. It pretty much centered on that. So I'm trying to get to other topics. Sure. Uh, it, that, it revolves in crime, though. If we I, set up sanctioned camping, correct. You know, it makes our city safer. I, un I understand. Um, um, let's talk about, I, I, I want to get to this because I think this is, is critically important. On March 1st of this year, Farmington police officers shot and killed a 25-year-old after a traffic stop. Moments after that shooting, a dispatcher can be heard saying on the scanner, quote, all units on the Farmington incident, make sure your body cams are shut off. What are your thoughts on an officer's ability to turn off his or her body cameras in a situation dealing with the public? Erin, I'll start with you. That's actually one of the reforms that we put in place back in August of 2020. You can go check it out. Um, I, I we, have it here. Actually. You have it there. We put those reforms in place to ensure that there were stronger consequences essentially for officers turning their body, body camera off when they were not allowed to do so. And we also made transparency easier for the public in order to, hit, or to be able to access that body camera footage. So but we, they are still allowed though to, to turn it off. It's just under certain circumstances. Under certain circumstances. But we also haven't heard any reform recommendations from the Commission on Racial Equity and Policing who have evaluated body camera use and policies across this nation who haven't brought us any new recommendations. If they do, then we're gonna look at those and we, we'll, we're likely to implement those in Salt Lake City, but it is working very well right now. Rocky, go ahead. Yeah, it's great to have body cams, but then what do you do with what you've got on the body cam footage? There was a 13 year old autistic boy, the mother called the police, said, you know, he might have a pellet gun, he's just having a, a really tough time. Police officer shows up, shoots him. He's got lifetime injuries. It costs the city $3 million in settlement, no, discipline for that officer. Then you've got Ryan Outlaw, a black man who is on the floor of the Cubby Department's elevator, bleeding to death. The police get there over 25 minutes after the call came in. Two of them stand there talking to him, not once touching him, not putting pressure on him, which all of us know that's what you do when you have a major wound. And they did nothing about it. He died two hours later while well, they sat and they were waiting for an ambulance to come. Why have first responders? Well, the mayor was asked by a news reporter, so wouldn't you rather your first responders do something to help people who are having these kind of medical problems? And her response was, I expect them to keep themselves safe. That is the officers, the first responders, she sound like the, the police chief at Uvalde. She said, because that's what they're trained to do. That's not what they're trained to do. They're trained to help the people of this community and provide first aid for them. There was also a, a, a body cam of a black man being attacked by a canine dog. The investigation there has been over three years in the police department. Thank you, Rocky. No discipline for that officer. I'll, I'll, I'll let you respond. Michael, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so this is a very important issue to me. Um, before the Pantages, I was a community activist and organizer. I've been involved with Black Lives Matter a long time, Utah against police brutality. I was out there on the, the George Floyd protests, getting chased around by helicopters with police that didn't even have their names on their badges, getting shot with, you know, um, beanbag guns and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, what she doesn't mention is that for the last two years, Black Lives Matter Utah has been protesting her and calling for her resignation because she won't even meet with them. She's painted, you know, Black Lives Matter on the city hall there, but she's done nothing. She's protected a police chief who should have been removed from office a long time ago. Um, with Utah against police brutality, we were working to implement something called SLC PAC. This was something we brought from Chicago. It's basically a civilian review board to police the police. They'd be elected positions. They could investigate. Um, um, cases, they could hold people accountable, they could hire and fire cops. And what happened to that is um, when we brought it to light, her police chief, Mike Brown, went to the legislature. They got HB 415 that banned municipals from creating these civilian review boards to police police. Her civilian review board right now is mostly vacant. It's been vacant for a long time. It's very different to sit up say, here and say you're going to do something and, and, and then actually what your actions show, what the community has been protesting and calling for your resignation about. Um, this is a very ser serious issue. 
it needs to be investigated and um, we need to have police that, that are held accountable that are charged with murder when they're out there murdering people. Michael, Their job is you. to bring people um, to court, not to execute them in the streets. Thank you. Aaron, you may respond. The cases that Mr. Anderson brings up are no doubt tragedies, period. But what he never quite learned as mayor is that he isn't the judge. He's not even the litigator of these situations. And it isn't the mayor's job to lead an angry mob based on his opinion of what happened. The district attorney checks these cases. We conflict them out to another police department who then evaluates the cases as well. Those police officers were doing what they were trained to do because the perpetrator of that stabbing was unknown, was still on the loose, and was not secure. And that's why not the mayor but the district attorney decided that those officers were acting within their training. This kind of inflammatory and no due process approach by mayors is incredibly damaging and dangerous for us as a community. You, you may respond, but can you Thank do a quick, we are running I'll, out I'll of time. I'll do this really quickly. <laughs> response this case response. never went to the DA's office. That is a fabrication and we know that uh, this man died while those officers stood there and while they were standing there they called in there's a transcript of it to dispatch saying the scene is safe for medical to arrive and that was never their excuse they said they didn't provide him aid because they were afraid the elevator door was going to shut they let a man die because they couldn't pull a man out between two of them or one of them stopped the elevator door from closing while the other one do what we all as passers-by would do and that is apply pressure to try to save this man's life. Our police are not passers-by. Can I, can I give a response to that? I, I want to Quickly. mention to the Black Please. Lives Matter. The previous leader of Black Lives Matter who led through 2020, you, you may remember who she is, she said, it's a historic day, quote, it feels like we've been heard. It feels like this will save lives, what, uh, what I did with our police reforms in August of 2020. This is a huge win. People's lives will be saved by what Mayor Mendenhall did today. That actually happened. So people are entitled to their opinions. And in my line of work, there are certainly people who disagree with the approach the city's taking. But it's not fair to characterize this as a uh, whatever way Mr. Valentine is characterizing it. Just real quick, okay. just 10 seconds. <laughs> well, well, 10 seconds, the and former, then we need to move on. The person she's talking about was one of the people that led HB 415 that tried to get it implemented and uh, is literally, you know, um, teaching the, the current person of Black Lives Matter. So to say that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank That's you. Just ridiculous. Uh, okay, I, I, I want to ask this last question because I know it's important to a lot of you here in the audience. Um, according to today's homeowner study, Utah ranks 45th in the country for affordability. On average, Utahns spend 41% of their monthly income on housing. With interest rates as they are right now, it's so expensive to buy or even to rent. Okay, I know we've talked about home. You, you all, we haven't here in this forum, but you all have talked about homelessness. I want to talk about what happens to working class students. Mm -hmm. How are they going to be able to afford to live here in the city instead of moving out to Tooele County? Rocky, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. And, oh, may I interrupt too? Because since we're running out of time, can I give them each a minute to answer, okay. please? The, the current mayor talks about, oh, we've done 4,000 units of affordable housing. Well, she's talking about affordability for people who are at 80% of the average median income. That's not any of us, I don't think, in this room right now. There's been nothing done to provide for permanent affordability. She, she's attached to the market. She loves putting millions of dollars into the pockets of developers of what are mostly ugly and unaffordable housing units throughout this community. I have proposed non-market housing where the city can build it, we make it architecturally beautiful, it's mixed income, and you can take it out of the market so you can guarantee people there that they'll be housing secure rather than housing insecure like so many renters are now who don't know if they're gonna be priced out of their apartments in the next year or two. Because there is a better way 
Most of the rest of the world is doing it, and it's really catching on in the United States now. Michael, go ahead. Again, we're talking yeah. about a fo not homelessness. Sure, sure, I get you. <laughs> not that that's not important. Don't Everything's get me wrong. It's just that it's, yeah. so much time has been yeah, I get you. focused so, on that um, in the past. This gets to the heart of corruption. Aaron Mendenhall has took over $100,000 from real estate corporations in the 2019 and 2023 election. She took donations from the Pantages developers while they were negotiating that. Deal. They, she took donations from Gail Miller, why they're negotiating that deal. Before her husband even left the city council, he petitioned to buy public property, and they did it all with a fake company, Renee Property, that didn't even exist. So it gets into the heart of um, a lot of lies that she'll talk about in a second about building 4,000 just said these units aren't affordable they're 60 to 80 percent ami most of that that what that correlates to is forty five thousand to sixty thousand dollars per year and what's wild about this um her corrupt rda director has been harassing me on social media but one thing that he said was fascinating he said 60 to 80 percent ami those numbers i just quoted were for service workers it shows how out of touch this administration is how in the pockets of developers and corporations no service workers making sixty thousand dollars a year it's just absolutely ridiculous. We need to be building zero to 30% AMI for real working people. I'm Michael, the only one that's you. up here who's a student who is a working person. Thank you. Aaron. Okay, I need to just mention the rate of conspiracies coming out of his mouth is insane. <laughs> and that he himself that admits huh? that there are, a, please, he has $100,000 of debt to attorneys who have told him he's wrong about these things that he still hasn't paid. Salt Lake City is building more affordable housing than every mayoral administration combined by a lot, 413% increase in our investment in the creation of affordable housing units. Yes, 4,000 of them that didn't exist before 20 have been created. And guess what else? Politicians don't decide what is affordable. HUD does that. They take our IRS data, they say this is the income of the area, and then you invest at 100%, 60%, 30% AMI. And guess what else? We've been in a housing crisis for over 17 years. We need housing of all types. Your professors here, your teachers at elementary school, the bus drivers with UTA, firefighters, city workers. People need housing at all incomes. When it comes to permanent supportive housing, meaning if you make zero Aaron, dollars, you. we've created 577 new thank units you. since 2020. All right, this concludes. We really need to move on, otherwise we're gonna get ten cut seconds, off in our, seconds. 10 seconds, this 10 seconds. conspiracy theories, I have the conflict of interest document that you forged that said Renee Properties. I have all the information about this. It's public records. You and your okay, campaign have that, been lying. Okay, that's 10 morning, seconds, like, thank you, thank election. you. Uh, this concludes our question and answer section. Okay. And now we need to go to closing statements. And Rocky, because you drew third for opening, you may now go first. You, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. You have one minute. You each have one minute. Oh, wow. I apologize. Okay. I well, apologize. I'm running for mayor because I, I served for two, two terms. I never dreamt I would run for mayor until working downtown on 3rd South and Main Street, I saw all the people on the street, one of them living there for over a year and a half that I took under my wing and finally got into an apartment. I personally paid his rent. I couldn't get the mayor. I wrote to her. I was met with nothing but indifference, no solutions. I even suggested, how about some public toilets? We have feces and urine, and these people have no, you're not, they're not allowed any public dignity or hygiene. They just completely blew us off, and their response was, oh, we've got a city contractor that will come clean it up. That's the kind of problem solving this administration engages in, and that's how callous this administration has been toward the homeless in our community, and they turned their backs on hundreds of people out in the freezing cold last winter, some of whom died, some of whom lost limbs, Rocky, fingers, thank and you. toes. Thank you. Um, Aaron, you're next. Yeah, this election, while homelessness is the number one issue we end up talking about, and justifiably so, is the biggest challenge our city and, frankly, this nation is facing right now in cities across the country. This is about tone of leadership. This is about the city going it alone to get a headline, as he's already bragged about, or the city getting the partnership through the state, the county, even service providers, and other cities like West Valley City, who wouldn't even come to the meetings three years ago and are hosting almost 200 beds for winter overflow. Sandy City Council, who just approved three weeks ago, a medically vulnerable population housing place where a hotel used to be. Cities are showing up and they're saying, Salt Lake City's done their share. 
Salt Lake City is going to keep doing more than our share, but we shouldn't be doing it alone. And that's ultimately, as you can tell, the greatest contrast between me and my opponents. Can we do it together? We're going to get a whole lot more done. More housing, cleaner air, Aaron, and we're going to be you. able to save the lake when we thank work you. together. Michael? So this is a very, very easy election. Uh, on one hand, we have a mayor who's stolen public property with her husband. That public pro that property is now worth $54 million. She's, she's taken donations from developers. She's worked against the public the entire time. And all, all while she's attacking the most vulnerable people, 160 people died last year. Homelessness, the lake, all these issues are important, but we got to bring it back to the very foundation of personal character, integrity, um, transparency, and accountability in government. We can't do anything unless we have workers or uh, have a city uh, council and a mayor that actually works for the public, doesn't serve corporations, isn't there getting rich off the backs of people dying in the streets. Um, you know, it, it's absolutely obscene. This should, it should be something that we can all agree on across all parties. Um, I represent a very different path forward for this city. I respect Rocky. I think it's time for a new generation and to pass the torch. Um, you know, we've talked about working together no matter what happens here. But we need to uh, have people that are up there serving the public, and we don't Michael, have that right you. now. Thank you. And we want to thank all of you uh, for participating, you, being here this afternoon. For those of you in the audience, I want to thank you. Um, and on behalf of Hinckley Institute of Politics, Better Utah, KSL Television, KSL News Radio, thank you so much. Now, don't forget, you have to vote, right? Uh, Tuesday, November 21st is, is the date. So. And register. Well, make sure, well, yeah. <laughs> you gotta make sure you're registered before you vote. Thank you.